executing like give shout outs to everybody anyways um it, it academic mode now. Um, so today, my name is uh, hi, my name is Anthony Ramirez, and I'm a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University. Um, and Joey and I are uh, frequent collaborators, and he's a mentor of mine um, here at Texas A&M. And so the the beginning of this project, uh, well, the, the title of it is Critical Cultural Exploration of Video Games it Bases Within Dejanex Communities. And so we can move on to the next slide. And so Go ahead. With this one. Okay, so uh, you know we talk about intro. It's our introduction, to inspiration, and so one of the things like when we saw the call for this conference was just like, what do they even mean by like Latinx culture and video gaming? Because as like I teach popular culture, I'm I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Anthony's from El Paso, and um, the, you know, the tortillas you see here resulted from a project that I did with uh, a, a student of mine when I taught at the University of Incarnate Word, where he was like, you know how our aunts and like our tias and our abuelas see things in the tortillas? Like, what if, like, how could we do that? And my other friend was like, we have a laser cutter at the hacker space. I think we can do it. And then like, next thing I know, I'm at like this arts festival laser cutting tortillas with images on them and to me that's like very san anto like very san antonio uh kind of culture where they're mixing popular culture and our culture together and so one of the things that um inspires us to kind of do the work that we're doing is looking at how like our latinx kind of working class culture has influenced us in terms of how we interact with video gaming and how we see video gaming. And uh, one of the things I'd like to make clear, and I, I don't know if Anthony wants to jump on this with me, is just the fact that we're total amateurs. We're lovers of video gaming. We are we're not video gaming academics. Um, we were just people that are really excited about this. And so do not think we think we know more than anything other than what we're showing. So thank you all so much for having us. I'll, I'll let Anthony take back over. <laughs> so, um moving forward from what Joe, uh, what Joey just mentioned um one of the things we were thinking about with this project was again our lived realities our experiences as individuals and um here i'm showing off a picture of uh, my early college days when i was much slimmer and uh yeah well a bunch of my best friends there and so um there in that picture is uh, before gaming clans were a thing or anything like that. My friends and I um, were in a, a gamer tournament. And so we all of us were are, are to this day still play video games and we still think about video game communities and fandom and things like that. And so from this group of friends, we still um, meet every Friday in the evening to play video games with one another. And so this idea of community was something and identity really resonated with me personally. And with Joey, as you can see here in this other image, he's a business owner. And so this is his hi-fi shop in San Antonio called Dreamanoids. So um, promotion, definitely promotion there. Um, and so what, we're, what we wanted to do was intersect these two things that are both passionate to us. And that's the reason why we wanted to do this study and to conduct this type of research. And so uh, integrating and intersecting these two identities that we have and see what we can find with it. And so moving forward, we found, um, we wanted to uh, focus on our two home cities. Again, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and uh, Joey's from San Antonio. And so, again, both of these communities and cities are largely populated with Latinx and Hispanic, uh, you know, individuals. And, and so, again, uh, El Paso has 83%, uh, San Antonio 64.2%. And so um, these are two things that we um, thought about highly in this uh, project. Um, within our literature review, we... Um, looked at a lot of different perspectives, uh, theoretical perspectives. Um, we um, looked at uh, Ansaldúa, Benjamín, uh, Bordeaux, Habermas, um, Strobar, and some uh, and a lot of great um, introduction video game research that focused on video games and communities because that was something, again, that's very important to us um, within this um, part particular uh, research. 
moving forward, we did a grounded theoretical approach. Uh, what we did was that our methods were basically, uh, the way that we're writing this is basic uh, textual analysis, but the way we conducted this uh, research was through uh, visiting uh, these locations and spaces and um, using a semiotic analysis to uh, conduct cultural and social um, you know, analysis. And we like just examined by uh, uh, attending these different spaces and just um, soaking in the culture and just kind of like uh, digesting everything while we were there. So um, we were able to examine, again, various cultural and social signifiers um, within these spaces. So these are our research questions. Uh, what are the lived realities of Latinx gamers, developers, and gaming culture enthusiasts within Texas, uh, both in geographical and generational um, ways? Uh, the next question that we asked is, what are some of the cultural signifiers of these Latinx gaming spaces, shops, arcades, gaming studios that showcase Latinidad? Um, the next thing that we wanted to ask was Latinx community versus Latinx content. Can we identify Latinx gaming communities in Texas as well as Latinx themed gaming content uh, in and popular culture artifacts uh, creators within Texas as well? And so these are some of the locations that we had in mind and that we were able to find within the po uh, process of this uh, research project. So we found some gaming stores, gaming arcades, gaming conventions, both in the digital and physical format. We also found social platforms and uh, applications dedicated to conversations relating to uh, gaming industry, such as Discord and Meetup. We also found uh, gaming development uh, related conversations, again, through these um, applications. We found out there are gaming cafes, uh, swap meets, flea markets, and mercados, which are primarily centered around um, the Latinx and Hispanic culture. These are the shops that we were able to find within um, the two cities that we are focusing on today. Um, El Paso is, again, a smaller city in comparison to San Antonio. So as you can see here, San Antonio definitely had a lot more shops in comparison to um, El Paso. And so um, one of the limitations we're going to mention throughout this uh, project is that timing was an issue. And so uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to visit all the shops mentioned here. And also due to the fact that timing was an issue, we weren't able to physically travel to El Paso. So a lot of what um, you're going to see here are based on the past experiences that I've uh, uh, went through uh, living in El Paso and also through um, social media and Google that we were able to get, gather this data. And so um, with San Antonio, we were able to visit about uh, seven shops, correct? Yeah, seven shops. And so um, it, we're going to go over some of the stuff that we collected. Oh, I think yeah. we there okay. we go. Yeah. So um, so those were the physical spaces, as I mentioned. But in uh, the digital spaces in El Paso, we found that excuse me, that there was a gamer development meetup that somebody was interested in creating a video game. And so through this app called uh, Meetup, they were able to connect and build a community of uh, various um, creators and, and, and people interested in creating video games and wanted to build a video game through this application. And it, within San Antonio, we found out there's a Creator Gaming Society of San Antonio, and they had both a convention online or a gaming jam, which was held on Twitch, and then they also had a Discord where they would have multiple forum conversations of uh, of um, a development of just being in love of of, the, of video games and just the community of video games in general. So we found that extremely fascinating. We didn't partake in any of the conversations, anyways. We just kind of observed. Yeah. All right, let me go to the next slide. There we go. And so the next thing that we wanted to um, focus on too, and we found this to be incredibly important within the fact that this kept within the Latinx um, idea too, is that what are the surrounding areas? And so we found that most of these spaces within both of the cities were in um, lower to uh, lower middle class environments and, and um, spaces. So as you can see here in El Paso, we see that um, oh, by the way, all the stores that we focus on are not like mainstream stores like GameStop or um, or Best Buy, Target, and et cetera. They're mainly mom and pop shops or uh, used game used um, 
game shops. So we wanted to focus on that as well. So I forgot to mention that earlier. But anyways, going back to um, what I was mentioning is that a lot of these um, um, stores are located in like shopping centers. And as you can see, there uh, is a dental store, a liquor store surrounding. Uh, we have um, a Dollar General a grocery store is around there too. Um, and uh, there, in, in this bottom image, you can see that there's um, some restaurants around there as well, like fast food restaurants. Uh, moving to San Antonio, you'll see um, an even more um, Latinx related um, community, especially on this bottom part. This is more of a middle class community. Um, and you'll see like on this bottom image where it says game lot there, you see pronto insurance. Again, pronto means fast in Spanish. Oh, we have a Taqueria Jalisco, which is a Mexican restaurant there. So there you can really see uh, see and the how the Latinidad is truly showcased within these uh, physical spaces here. On this top image, you can't really see the sign, but because it's not there yet, but um, Google, uh, because uh, Google didn't have a image at that time. But this is where um, one of the shops is under right next to Jackson Hewitt. It's um, the anime um, Otaku Cafe. So they had an arcade in the very back of the um, location. And then moving forward, um, some of the cultural signifiers that we started to witness within um, these gaming spaces are um, one, visual uh, gamers appearance. We, it was evident through um, the images that we found online and in, that we noticed in person that the individuals within these shops were Latinx individuals or Mexican-American, Mexican, American, Mexican um, or Hispanic. Um, and so we were able to notice this within both of the um, 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 spaces and, and cities. So this is something really, really prominent within our work. The next thing that we noticed was language, the use of language. And so most of these shops in El Paso were bilingual, that they spoke in English and Spanish. In San Antonio, we didn't notice that as much, um, but we are pretty sure that these shops are bilingual, again, based on the communities that they're located in. Uh, familismo is another cultural signifier that we found within this um, pr project. Um, both of these shops are very family oriented in the sense that families would go in and buy shop, uh, buy games for their, their children. And it became kind of a generational type of, uh, um, not necessarily a hand-me-down, but more of a, a generational type of a way of connecting with one another, kind of like with uh, Joey. And we can see right here in this image, this is Joey's son, Jojo, who is now playing the, his uh, uh, Nintendo Switch. And so parents, and, and, and as I mentioned here in, in the slide, that parents and current uh, parents who are current or firm, former gamers are now buying consoles for and games for their children now. And so again, that aspect of familismo, which is a really, really huge cultural signifier within, um, you know, Latinx communities and, and culture is really prominent within the these spaces as well. Again, food is another cultural signifier that um, really resonated within these spaces. As I mentioned, there's cafes within some of these shops. And so within these cafes, we started to see that there's snacks dedicated to the Latinx and Hispanic community, featuring hot Cheetos, hot Cheetos with cheese, papas locas, um, drinks that are flavored like tres leches, arroz con leche, or um, they have uh, snacks that are Mexican candies with chile that are um, sweet and sour or sweet and spicy. And then another thing that we found interesting that we really want to make a note about too is that there was also a lot of Asian inspired candies too. While that doesn't rest really um, um, resonate with the Latinx um, theme that we're describing, we thought it was still worthy of mentioning too, because it was pretty, pretty prominent within these shops as well. Hot Cheetos with gaming is totally a thing. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. dude, there's, uh, there's a whole, yeah, we can do like a whole thing where we could invert and just do gastronomy uh, anthropology and, and look at like where Hot Cheetos intersect with everything in life and Latino culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hot Cheetos and Mexican and, and chamoy in general. Chamoy yeah. is like a chili uh, pepper that you can goes on everything. Yeah, well, we could do a whole book on that. <laughs> definitely. So um, again, as I've re referenced throughout, oh, and takis as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Takis. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dori locos. That's yeah, another thing. We can go on yeah. snacks and uh, on and on about that. But Anthony and I like <laughs> have talked about doing like books about food culture all over Texas and the nuances of it. So yeah. 
So okay. as I mentioned throughout this conversation with you all, um, a major limitation within our study was time. That was our biggest, biggest limitation. Initially, Joey and I wanted to conduct interviews and interact with um, people within the gaming community. But unfortunately, due to the time um, between um, the, the, the time that we uh, sent in the application for this uh, conference and the time that we got accepted, we figured we didn't have enough time to get IRB approval to interview um, members of the gaming community within these Latinx spaces. So that was something that we kind of had to push aside for a later time. Again, uh, that affected our data collection. And um, all, another uh, thing that's affected our gaming, uh, our, our uh, data collection is that um, in, in March, there's going to be some uh, con conventions and gaming events within San Antonio and also in El Paso um, that we can attend again because today's the conference. So um, that happened. And um, also we're currently in a pandemic still. So that was another reason why we couldn't really travel as much too, especially towards El Paso, uh, to El Paso. Um, but yeah, so those were some of the limitations that we had. So um, in conclusion, oh, further discussion. So um, as Joey and I mentioned, we've had like a lot of conversations and a lot of the scholars that are here in this space, in this um, symposium with us today are having these conversations that we, we are, are having today. And these are things that we kept thinking about. Uh, gaming cosplay, Latinx gaming cosplay, interviewing Latinx gamers and um, these conventions, all these different spaces and their forms of representation that can be held within um, the different uh, facets of, of uh, gaming, especially within Latinx representation. And so these are things that we were thinking about throughout this whole process too, of how the door can really be opened within this process of community, Latinx gaming communities. Yeah, so um, that's like uh, 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 basically what we've done. What I wanna do is I actually wanna stop the the whoops not the screen share sorry my bad <laughs> should have done that let me go back okay um i want to exit the uh slideshow and i want to show you all just some crude not crude as in like crude but like uh photos from uh latinx representations and things like that so uh just real quick i know we only got a couple minutes um this is this guy's name is christian rios and he was my he's my business partner in the business that i own but before we started our hi-fi store. That big mural is there because he opened an arcade there. And he was a student of mine uh, at the University of Incarnate Word. That's his shirt. And so when he was like 22, he quit working for Apple Corporate and decided to open up his own arcade. And so this is us in uh, um, not uh, uh, Lockhart, Texas. And this guy uh, owned like, I don't know, two, 300 arcades, uh, uh, consoles. And, uh, and we went and bought some machines from him. And this is like Christian at, at the space setting up. That was like his first Tetris. And this was once the space was set up, like we would have parties, events, you pay money to come and, and game. And so um, we just kind of, you know, I wanted to show you that this, you know, the other thing we did was we developed our own gaming uh, 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 controller fight stick. Like I did all this research on fight sticks. Um, I had a friend that knew how to do SolidWorks, which is like a 3D modeling program. And we went to a hacker space, built the enclosures. I ordered all the parts from Japan. And because I, I learned all about their nerdiness of the action of the buttons and which ones to get and the, you know, the way the joysticks work and, and everything like that. And so, you know, this, this project meant a lot to us for both uh, Anthony and I, because we went back in our, in our catalog of, you know, this is like when Christian was uh, hosting a, a little booth at a community college and uh, at the community college he set up to promote his event and you know it's a very latino centric space it's called palo alto community college and um you know they have frito pies and uh, there's chamoy there <laughs> you know uh, street tacos like you know everything that that the manzanas locos uh uh i mean just yeah so you know all that to say um when we went to these shops uh, I, I asked Anthony to go to San Antonio with me for a weekend while I ran my shop and I took him around where, I, where, where I, like my, my stomping grounds is on the west side of San Antonio. And um, that's our shop. And then we actually went, oh, we got a Spider-Man donut. But um, <laughs> uh, we went to these gaming shops and Anthony got photos and kind of documented in video. 
uh, some of the spaces. And so what we're going to be doing, like our actual output is going to be a blog. Like I, I am not an academic. I have a PhD in cultural or in, uh, in new media from UT Austin. I'm an associate professor of the practice. I'm not a tenure track professor. So I publish all my stuff online personally. Uh, I'm not really looking to be in journals or anything like that. So I, I'm taking Anthony to the dark side with me for just one project because he does publish. Uh, and I'm like, hey, let's make a blog. Let's have photos. Let's have videos. And to kind of give you a preview of what that kind of means is that um, I was telling uh, before we got started that I do automotive research. So what that typically looks like is something like this, where I'll give my academic speech and I say, feel free to skip if casually reading. And I talk about all the cultural influences and signifiers, but I have photos, video, and text for people to read. And so what we're going to be creating out of this presentation is taking the videos, taking the photo, the raw photos that we showed you and curating it and creating it into a blog that is like an academic piece that we'll then share with you all uh, when we get it all together. So we don't want to stomp on other people's time, but thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so our next uh, paper on this panel is Arthur DeSoto Vasquez, and he's gonna be talking to us about esports. Great, thank you. Let me uh, see if I can share my screen. I think I need the hostability also. Let's see, am I allowed to give you that? Let me see. No, nope, that just says chat with you. Oh, I might be able to, let's see. Okay, I think I have it. There oh, we go. Okay, great. Excellent. I was okay. panicking. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm really glad to follow up with that last conversation from Anthony and Joey. Uh, I've worked with Anthony before on a project, not related to video games, but um, I think there's some some crossovers and, and what, as, as little as y'all were talking, I was thinking of other things to mention, kind of refresh my memory. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my experience being essentially a club advisor uh, for an esports team. And I'm going to kind of put that in quotations because we're still trying to figure out what we are exactly uh, living here on the on the US Mexico border. And so um, as I've been thinking about this conversation, I've been kind of doubting my my title here even because I think that the designation of esports is a little problematic. And that's what I want to talk about pretty much throughout this entire. Uh, lecture. So um, first off, let me mention that um, this club has been in existence since roughly uh, 2019. Um, there were some students who approached an adjunct colleague of mine who does a lot of gaming um, locally. And, you know, he basically said, this is too much for me to take on as an adjunct. It's just not really something I can do. So I said, okay, I'm willing to do it. I was a new, new faculty member willing to start. And First off, I think to show the kind of spectrum of what the club does, um, this first image here just showcases some of the free play that happens every week. Uh, we've transitioned from going, uh, renting out rooms on campus to having a sort of a designated spot at the, uh, at the gaming lounge on campus. Um, and this is kind of the very casual, um, you know, focus is hang out, bring your console and, and play um, all the way to hosting you know, sort of major tournaments um, in the community. And um, this one was called Hidden Flame. The other major one is called Battle at the Border. And uh, we call it Hidden Flame because, uh, or the students call it Hidden Flame because uh, the idea is that in December it's cold everywhere and in Laredo it's, it's nice, and, nice and toasty. Usually, except right now it's really cold. Um, but this is kind of the events that we're going for. Uh, there was a lot of momentum in 2019 and early 2020 and uh, unfortunately, the pandemic, sim similarly to the, the previous research, you know, did kind of put a little bit of a wrinkle in all this, but I'm hoping to get it back uh, on track. And so uh, since I was asked to be the advisor, I thought, hey, this is a great opportunity to talk and think a little bit through um, what does it mean to be uh, an esports club? What does it mean to be Latinx and be playing uh, video games in this culture, be in the binational area? And so that's where this really project started to emerge. I was like, okay, let me uh, follow along and see what uh, is happening here. And as I've kind of thought about it more, um, I changed the title from the from the the program here. So originally it said U.S. Uh, uh, sorry, esports on the U.S. Mexico border. 
and decided to kind of drop that US-Mexico part because while we are physically on the border, I think this idea of being on the border also kind of resonates with our kind of almost even a, you know ontological discussion of what we are uh, as a club and, and as a group of people. Uh, and so I wanted to keep on extending that metaphor um, as, as I go through this presentation, because I think it's interesting. What does it mean to be on the border? Not just the US-Mexico border, but many different types of borders. Um, so obviously the border is a physical place. It's La de la Nova, La de la where I'm from, uh, where I live, sorry, rather. I'm from El Paso originally, just like Anthony. Uh, and I have to say, uh, compared to the other two cities previously mentioned, La de is 95%. <laughs> Latino Hispanic. Uh, so we've, you know, uh, when we're working here, we pretty much have a, a predominantly Mexican American Latino uh, community that we're dealing with. Um, however, others have talked about the border as also this kind of metaphorical and liminal place. And so those of us who've grown up on it or lived on it or ever been here, you know, that Selena uh, common phrase of like uh, from the movie of neither being here nor there. Um, you know, not being accepted by others, but not being totally one of the other is just a characteristic of, of all of our lives. And I think that kind of concept applies well to studying things like um, where we're at in esports culture. Um, there's all these different kind of binaries that seemingly, you know, appear to be binaries, but I think when we take a little closer look at them, how they're actually put into practice um, in, this, in this particular um, Phenomena that I'm that I'm looking at uh, and living with my with my club um, are are pre highly present, right? So there's this difference between play and work, uh, between being amateur and a professional. Um, the club and defined as a club where people hang out and, and just you know play together versus like the competitive aspect of being a team. Um, there's all these kind of different you know dynamics and, and seeming dichotomies between identity, whether it's being you know, uh, part of a larger group uh, as being somebody who lives on the border and Hispanic Latino, but also the differences between um, folks who cross and are Mexican and come and play in tournaments or in the club, those who are uh, US-based Americans, um, the people in the club feeling like kind of this own unique identity of, of club members versus, um, you know, being situated kind of also as outsiders within the larger university of kind of a, a plucky team uh, and whether, you know, the, it's defined really as this kind of group of players or truly a organization in and of itself that has to have leadership. Uh, and that's particularly been a, a challenge that I'll talk a little bit about, more about later. Uh, but no, nonetheless, I think this border kind of perspective allows us to live in the in-between uh, and really kind of be okay with these dichotomies and even like seemingly transcend them, uh, which has really just been our actual experience. And I'll talk more about that too. Um, so it's just a couple of, of slides that show uh, some more of our marketing materials. Um, I really like this, this slide in particular because uh, this, this marketing that, that the team came up with, um, because one, it talks about being a battle at the border, um, which is you know, historically interesting as well, given uh, things like the Mexican-American War. But um, if you look at the logo kind of in the background there, um, you can see the wings of this uh, on this shield icon. Um, have the uh, U.S. flag on the left side and the Mexican flag there on the right, really kind of indicating this uh, truly transnational, uh, binational uh, approach to how um, it's done here on campus. I also like to think of, this is something I wrote for a class, but <laughs> I thought it was relevant here as I've been thinking about this more, um, that the border and the bridge also can kind of be a metaphor for how the internet digital technologies uh, play in kind of Reifying difference, but also bridging differences as well. Deconstructing long-standing barriers between entertainment and politics, but also uh, blurring them into ways we haven't seen before. Uh, things between the personal and the social, all these different genres and various uh, ontological and epistemological uh, divides. I've had the opportunity to teach a class called Digital Borders and Bridges. And while it is partly about kind of the border, it's also about how the internet is changing all of these uh, dichotomies that we have. Um, seemingly set up. So a little bit on kind of this theme as well of, of where exactly is it and where it fits in uh, in terms of esports. Um, from sports management, there's a you know debate about whether esports is considered a proper sport or something else. What is it? Um, and there's also the the challenge of when when streaming is this a you know a, a visual virtual world? Is it what's the relationship as 
uh, people when they get online, what are they doing? Um, and I think these are kind of relevant discussions to this kind of larger ontological kind of question of what esports is, um, at least when, at least not, you know, at the when practice at the local level, right? So um, what I decided to do, and it's kind of been stop and go because of the pandemic, um, was essentially to take an ethnographic approach um, and uh, study, be a part of this community. I'm their advisor, so there's a little bit of, of kind of difference there and, and power differential. Um, but I wanted to do like an in-depth study of the practices, rituals, and communication um, associated with this group. I will say, you know, totally uh, full disclosure, and this is probably where I need this group's uh, help here, is that uh, I never really have studied video games before. Um, and, you know, my focus has always been more so on like Latino, Latina communication, um, digital identity and culture. And so I'm kind of approaching it from the where in the, the methodological ways that I'm comfortable, but um, some of the theory and ideas that I'm using, I'm less so. Um, and I'm certainly willing to think about and, and really encourage people's thoughts on where this project could go potentially. We'll talk a little bit about kind of what we've seen so far. Um, and these relate to what we've been talking about already. Um, there's certainly a struggle to define what it is. And this has actually taken place uh, both in media uh, interviews that we've done um, in conversations with the university about what we are, uh, what we need as a, uh, as a club within the university, um, even kind of a question of where we fit into the bureaucracy and the hierarchy of the institution. Um, and that has relations to like the rules that we have to follow or things we can or can't do, um, which is really interesting to me at least. I don't know, maybe I'm just getting older. <laughs> and uh, things like uh, the, the participant perspectives, you know, we've seen a lot of transition because it's not a team, um, there's a lack of recruitment. Um, and so there's this kind of question of professionalism versus being amateurs, uh, but also because there's less structure, like there's enables a lot more entrepreneurism as well uh, within the club, which is, I think is, is pretty interesting. So um, here's a, a clip of an interview or at least a screenshot of, of a post to an interview uh, um, that we did right before the pandemic happened, promoting that, that event I showed earlier. This was in the, on Telemundo. Um, same studio that does NBC, of course, but um, I think one of the issues that that came up in this interview was trying to explain what exactly the club is, uh, because it wasn't clear that for this tournament um, that it would be open to the public, uh, that anybody could register, uh, or that even people who were under 18 could come and attend uh, with parental permission. Um, and that's also something that's kind of resonated throughout the university, where it's like, oh, okay, you're not you know, you're different than other organizations on campus because you're not just appealing to um, the university, but there's also other places to do this gaming outside of the university um, as well. Uh, one thing that I've really tried to figure out and work with as the advisor is, is where does it fit within the university hierarchy uh, and organization? Um, you know, as a club within student life, we can book space on, on campus, um, we can create events, we can get them approved. Um, we can use PR services, um, but there's also rules and limitations behind that. Uh, Anthony and Joy were talking about takis and, and hachitos. Okay, we can't sell those things on campus uh, because we have a contract with, um, wait, well, well, actually we can rather, uh, we can sell hot food, anything prepared because the, of the contract with, um, who's our contract provider? Not Sodexo, um, I'm blanking on them, but uh, because of the contract with our food thing, we can't sell certain things. We can only sell, um, certain, so here's the interesting wrinkle. This is what I remember now. Okay, we can sell hot Cheetos packaged, but we can't put the hot cheese on it because <laughs> then that's a prepared meal. So there's all these you know, weird rules like that that are super interesting. Um, and right before the pandemic, there were some discussions of moving us to a different department, um, kind of being classified differently, but because of the confusion of where we would go and be, that really has to happen at the kind of almost presidential level of the university. Uh, and a lot of, I think that momentum was kind of lost uh, in the, during the pandemic kind of confusion. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to resume that. So uh, like I said, there's been some opportunities I think for participants because of this in-betweenness. Um, one is that the players can go and do their own things. We have some really highly, some highly ranked players in the state of Texas um, and they can go participate in a tournament in San Antonio, Austin, McAllen, um, wherever they, they so choose. Uh, and there's no restrictions because it's a club, right? It's, it's a sort of a free association of players. 
Um, when we have uh, local tournaments that are hosted on campus, that means that anybody from the border community, students at the community colleges, high school students, non-students um, can come and play in those uh, organizations. Um, there was, we were particularly excited because um, in one of our tournaments, we were able to uh, bring in somebody, one of like the top ranked players from Honduras. And that was just cool. Like everybody was, was really excited about that because uh, nothing like that had really ever been done here on campus. Um, the other thing too, is that as, uh, the flexibility of the club and the in-betweenness allows for things like vendors to come in um, to sell gifts or special trainings where they you know learn tips and tricks about the game um, that might not be necessarily able if they were as a different designation uh, and as these things are happening i've seen a lot of growth in in the students where they have to learning not just how to play the game uh, and play it competitively but also how to create an organization and run it um, which is what Taylor's called kind of this assembling of esports culture where you're starting to institutionalize things uh, and learn these skills along the way. Um, and that's something I've been really excited about just as an educator to see. Um, so a little a couple more images here, um, just start to wrap up. But um, this is just our free play that happens every other week. We're trying to get this back on track. Um, students bring their consoles. It's bring, bring your own console, as we call it. Um, open to anyone to join. Um, and we've had some people just kind of curiously walk in and walk by and decide to join. Um, there's also been discussions, I think, at our university about retaining male students. Um, and this is kind of a, a larger higher ed discussion. And something I've offered to that conversation is that I think increasing video game, um, video games and, and video game clubs and stuff like that can be also a way to uh, think about retaining male students and keep them engaged. Um, doesn't necessarily matter what they're doing as long as they're doing it with others, it'll keep them, um, you know, retained and, and within the system. Um, in terms of things like uh, being a little entrepreneurial or able to, to do things that may not happen in other contexts, um, you know, depending on who gets to register, there's uh, pots um, of, for winners, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, and this kind of follows the basic format elsewhere, but uh, it's something a little different for a university, maybe. Uh, also bringing in uh, these outside um, trainings can teach uh, the, the players techs. I play Super Smash at a very amateur level and I sometimes I'll play with them, but I tell them it's gonna be bad. Uh, and I'm really impressed by how you know detailed and, and thoughtful they are about the, the actual techniques uh, of the game. Um, now, some of the challenges that I think we face because uh, of all of these previously mentioned issues is um, how to self-regulate ourselves in terms of, of play. Um, and this particularly matters for things like fairness and balance. Um, one thing that come up is there was a OIT sponsored, uh, sorry, like our Office of Internet Technology sponsored tournament they wanted to do for Learning Technologies Week. And um, they insisted or, or really wanted kind of one tournament and uh, so that they could offer one prize at the end of the day. And we had to kind of explain, and, and our, our club leader really had to spend the time that if we do one tournament, amateurs are going to get destroyed, basically, uh, because they won't be fair uh, if uh, there are ranked players playing in these tournaments. It's just going to be a wash, essentially. Um, and and our, the club had to take a role in looking at who was registered for which bracket to make sure that there weren't ranked players trying to win uh, in the amateur bracket and potentially turn off any um, interested students to it. I think also this lack of kind of official designation from other parts of the university um, has been an issue in trying to translate what we actually do. And it'll continue to be one. Um, and then because we're dealing with students, the you know our club president just graduated and got a job, which we're super excited about. But um, we have to kind of start from scratch with a, a freshman leader. And uh, there's going to be a, lot, a big learning curve on just being a leader and getting those organizational skills uh, beyond just becoming a good player. Um, so this is that tournament I mentioned earlier and kind of how it was marketed. So what I would like to do next steps is um, in-depth interviews with club members and get their feedback, um, their thoughts on their experience. I think this has been my observation so far, what I presented, um, but I, I'm a truly a believer in that qualitative research should let the participants of experience talk for themselves. And they may have a different interpretation of, of, of how I have uh, presented these things, right? Like I said, we're also dealing with a transition in leadership. Um, and so there's gonna be some growing pains there, I believe. And that might itself be a whole study. Um, and um, I'm kind of curious, I think personally and intellectually about what's common to all clubs 
uh, gaming clubs or what's kind of specific to this border context um, and what what does this culture actually look like I'm learning to love the in-between I think uh, as somebody who likes to define things uh, but it's, it's certainly been interesting so um, I'd love to hear just thoughts on what directions this could go in any you know uh, free associations that we might have and here's my contact information I should say by the way I'm at Texas A&M International University not West Texas A&M uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I entered the wrong one there, but uh, yeah, we're in Laredo, Texas. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And then our final paper on this panel before we can open up the floor to questions is going to be from Jalen Jackson, who's going to be talking to us about Afro Latin America and video games. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share yeah. my screen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hello, all. My name is Jalen Jackson. I'm a current PhD student um, in the African American Studies Department at Northwestern University. Um, first, I'd like to definitely thank Dr. Penix Tadson uh, for helping make this possible, in addition to everyone who has worked to put this conference together. Um, today, I'd like us to consider the communities who think about, reflect on, and use video games, whether in academia, in the classroom, or otherwise. I would like to address just one of many glaring silences, particularly in video game studies, as often articulated through the global north. I refer to Afro-Latin America and what this geopolitical construct has to offer when we think about video games. With that, I take us to a quite popular video game franchise, um, Sid Meier's Civilization. Its most recent iteration is Civilization VI, published in 2016. The series is renowned as a turn-based strategy game in which, according to the game's official website, you attempt to build an empire to stand the test of time. In this game, you take control of one of the select civilizations like ancient Egypt or Rome, managing cities you can settle almost anywhere on a map usually filled with quote-unquote barbarians, developing tiles around cities to support an economy and engage with other civilizations. You research technologies that make different relationships with the game map and other players possible. You engage in diplomacy, war, and can even build world wonders. Given you have researched the proper in-game technologies to make the wonder available for construction, building these wonders provides your civilization with unique buffers. One such wonder is the Panama Canal. The end game canal does exactly what you might imagine. It connects bodies of water across stretches of land and allows ships to pass through it. Constructing the canal costs production points, which the civilization produces in varying quantities depending on how the player manages their civilization. Once you have an eligible construction area and a plan to secure enough production points, you too could have a Panama Canal in your possession if you move quickly enough. The real Panama Canal, as we currently know it, was constructed in the context of an interesting struggle between Colombia, the United States, and what will become Panama. Civilization VI's in-game encyclopedia acknowledges that Panama did not have ownership of the canal until 1999, 95 years after US guided construction first began in 1904. Unacknowledged is that between France's and the United States attempts to construct the canal, thousands and thousands of Afro-descendant workers from across the Western Hemisphere were attracted to the canal zone to work on the project, many of them facing astronomical mort mortality rates in the throes of capitalism. Between 1904 and 1914, the US segregated the immediate area around the canal, devalued black workers' labor significantly compared to white workers, and produced racist literature and artwork that reinforced knowledge about white supremacy in the Western Hemisphere. Panama may have succumbed to US imperialism when it came to ownership of the canal, but Panama was no passive recipient of Jim Crow racism. Panama was in fact the champion of anti-Black racism at several junctures in its history, despite the country's opposition to US imperialism. So what do we do with this major silence in Civilization VI? Knowing the history of the Panama Canal as one characterized by US imperialism in Latin America, founded upon anti-Blackness and discrimination against indigenous people from multiple sources. One answer is we play it, construct that wonder and dominate our opponents in the game mercilessly, maybe not in that exact way. But how do we study something like the silence on the Panama Canal wonder in Civ VI? With the canal having been situated in Latin America on doubly colonized lands, 
with the canal constructed by black labor from many different origins like Barbados, Martinique, Colombia, and the US. Furthermore, how do we study the silence on the Panama Canal in Civ 6 through institutions, industries, disciplines, and communities that have their own histories of anti-blackness that are replicated every day? This mini case study of Civ 6 is important because it highlights at least two pressing questions raised by the intersection between concepts related to Afro-Latin America and the medium of video games. The first is, how do we center Latin American experiences in our study of video games at the level of both form and content? The second pressing question is, if we think about identities like race and gender as technologies, what does it mean for constructs of race, gender, nation, the human, and so on to develop not only outside of virtual spaces, but also within virtual spaces. Some scholars and gamers have attempted answering this question, though these are questions that still linger in how we systematically think about and interact with video games. While I cannot provide any explicit answers to these questions as we speak, I can provide insight into some ideas that might challenge our approaches to engaging with video games in the communities that play them. Here are three hopefully generative assertions that a focus on Afro-Latin America and video gaming positions us to consider. The first assertion is that any study of video games requires a serious examination of race and racism as they manifest in, through, and beyond game worlds. The stakes of ignoring race in video game studies are high as there are human players who engage with video games in every sense when all is said and done from playing them to coding them and from reflecting on them to forming communities around them. This examination of race must be intersectional as well, of course. We cannot ignore markers of identity like gender, class, ability, and so on in our analyses. And we must also interrogate these technologies in the same breath. It is also important to note that angling a discussion of race in video games from the perspective of Latin America helps reveal a common blind spot in discussions of race emanating from the United States. And thus the second thing that the idea of Afro-Latin America offers video game studies is the assertion that when examining race in video games, one must also consider how constructs of nation, state, and empire inform definitions of race. Here we have to be careful not to treat blackness as if discussions about blackness only concern US American black people and one black experience fits all. In practice, this treatment of blackness looks like using black to mean Black US American in a simultaneously local and universal sense, or neglecting to interrogate whether a video game character's form of Blackness is indeed one that can be read as US American Blackness. The third orientation that a centering of Afro Latin American video game studies is an attention towards analyzing absences in addition to representative presences in video games. The late Toni Morrison argues in Playing in the Dark that it may be possible to discover through a close look at literary blackness, the nature, even the cause of literary whiteness. In this sense, the analytical framework that Morrison proposes is flexible in its ability to look at whiteness through blackness and vice versa, if you will, as it manifests in US American literature. This is significant because when we consider racial identity and literature deeply, and critically, it becomes easier to gaze beyond the image and draw connections between different racial identities, even between those identities that do not make it into the game world and those that do. Morrison's contentions are especially provocative when we think about Latin Americanness from a hemispheric perspective. In the context of Latin America, one cannot cleanly say that a black white binary characterizes the majority of Latin American countries race relations. Nonetheless, a North-South hemispheric binary has historically occupied the minds of Latin American and US American thinkers for a long time. Historically, the United States has featured prominently, though not exclusively, in discussions of race, Latin American identity, and imperialism. Through a close reading of those video games defined by US American whiteness, what might we learn about Latin American blackness? I'm not giving a pass to the creators of video games and continually censoring whiteness in virtual spaces and video game narratives. Oops, sorry. Oh, through, through describing this and the preceding orientations, I am suggesting we interrogate our disciplines and positionalities in ways that resist the hegemonic logics that sometimes characterize them and shape our methodologies and interactions with game worlds and the world of gaming.
Soraya Murray, for instance, asks us to consider how the logic of diversity and inclusion or corporate multiculturalism refigures itself into critical cultural studies. Murray writes, it is crucial that as post-colonial game study scholars, we are always critically reevaluating our relationship to the academy, rescuing game studies from its own shortcomings and conceptualizing new pathways towards useful critical frameworks. It is important not to fall in line with institutionalizing tendencies that bring rote bureaucratic performance that focus more on the appearance of compliance to inclusivity while failing to politically intervene in any meaningful way. Murray notes how sometimes the critical analysis of a text is treated as a signal that the work is done, referring to how once someone brings forth an incisive critique that centers a historically marginalized identity, the different kinds of social, financial, and cultural capital we gain from highlighting this perspective undermines our potentially transformative intentions. Nevertheless, we know that there is an infinite amount to learn from not just playing video games, but also from modding them, from inhabiting their worlds, from being in community around games and so on. And yet the second we remain silent about the conditions that make moments like this conference possible, we only see half the picture, locked into the mechanics dominating our worlds, distancing ourselves from our reflections in vain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the chat has been working hard during all these presentations. And so I've plucked a couple of questions uh, that I caught from the chat to kick us off. And then after that, uh, if you, I see, oh, okay, great. I see people's hands or are the, I don't know if these are clapping hands or raised hands. I was gonna say, uh, if you would prefer, you could type your question in the chat and I could read it for you. Or if you're comfortable reading your question out loud, maybe you could use the like hand icon and then I could throw the mic and the camera over to you. Um, so just as a, a one to get us started, and this was a question from uh, our keynote speaker uh, from Phil and his question was for Anthony and Joey. And so he said, how do you feel about game companies marketing to Latinx players? Is it a worthwhile endeavor, a stereotypical joke? or something in between? Oh, uh, <laughs> Anthony's pointing at me. I'm like, okay, I'll answer. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, you know, it's, it was funny because when you asked that question, I was like, oh, well, the keynote speaker talked and I was like, you were the keynote speaker. And I was like thinking about how, you know, the whole, all of the hardware that came out of this was out of exactly what you're asking. You know, it was out of this, this be this idea of, of a whole continent being ignored, you know, being ignored to the extent that the hardware itself, let alone the software, the content, the film, the movies, aka the video games in this context, couldn't even be played, let alone like experienced, right? And so I think for for the context of you know Latinx representation in gaming, um, I've really just seen it kind of come from independent makers you know independent developers and people with intentionality like we see in the comic book uh, arena and we see in the films you know and and then you see generational iteration of that right so you know uh i'm, I'm a i grew up i was born in 80 so you know i had like ejo right so it was like zoot suit and american me and you know stand and deliver and then you know, and then you had the, the, uh, then you had Selena and we were talking about the otherness and, and not fitting in, in the liminal spaces in his famous speech there. And I feel like for video gaming, we haven't even like gotten to that moment yet, um, where there's mainstream representation of Latino stories, other than where we have to jump in through comics, like with Miles Morales and, and other characters that are being crossed over from other universes into the gaming universe um but i think it's also something where uh because I, I have also have a background in game development uh i feel like getting it's a culmin it's a kind of like st steam or stem science technology engineering art and math where we it takes a culmination of of having latino leaders in these spaces and getting to see trajectory of themselves and the possibility that not only can you creatively think about these stories but we can technically implement them as well and entrepreneurially develop the the business so that it has a return on investment where uh you know because we live in a capitalistic society so that's my 
informal answer as as a wannabe academic <laughs> i mean just to kind of give my two cents on the matter um again um again i don't really do a lot of video game research a majority of my research focuses on uh comic books hence the reason why joey knows a lot of the comic book stuff because i nerd out with him um and so um what i do understand about uh video games is through my own lived reality of being a gamer and playing the video games there's a huge lack of representation of uh latinx characters within video games and i I would say a majority of the characters that i do see that are latinx are in sports games and even then it's very minute um i'm starting to see a little bit of characters um being represented within these um games and within these stories but again like joey mentioned a lot of it's like independent games like guacamele or um there's another one that i had a chance to play during um latinx um or hispanic heritage month too that um, microsoft had available uh through their game pass and so um you know it's it's very underrepresented oh um, you know the latinx community is very underrepresented just like in their other facets of uh popular culture and media and so I think that by increasing this representation, there's also going to be an increase of um, people wanting to make games, too, that, that represent uh, the culture, represent, you know, the race and represent um, people they want to see, too, and, and include intersectional identities as well. And, and I, you know, I, actually, also, I would assert that because um, I'm also I'm a polymath, so I, I come from a lot of different spaces. And one of them is I'm really into computers and how to build on my huge computer history tech you know nerd and you know that narrative is based around eurocentric white stories right and so most developers most people were all white and that was like also how we got with video gaming in general is mostly all white male cisgendered people that were creating games and uh, it's going to take us generations to also get through this to to be able to start creating stories like that because if you look at even hollywood at that point when those movies were starting to be made it was because we had gone through generations of filmmakers that were already white and they were looking for more stories to reach more people. And I think in the video gaming realm, we're, we're getting to the point now where uh, even 10 years ago, I had, I had artists that were getting into video game developing using like game maker studio and things like that and developing, you know, video games based off of, you know, well, what about like, the Mexican conquistador or Spanish conquistador uh, or conquistadors versus uh, Aztecs, but from the Aztecs perspective and having the, the protagonist be, you know, Aztec and, and having these stories told that from that perspective. And, you know, this, this guy was, or this, this adult was like 20, 20 years old or something like that. And was thinking in that, that facet and starting to have those tools. So in 2022, I see us, possibly being able to in the next eight, nine years, really being able to have those things line up. There's a lot of things at play. Anyway, sorry. I'm no, that's continue. great. Thank you guys so much. And just as a person who researches <clears throat> Latinx gaming communities, research like yours is really uh, groundbreaking and, and I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so am I? Yes, I'm on. Okay, so the next question um, was posed in the chat also by Phil, but it's something that um, I, I had in mind as well. So I'm the faculty advisor for our student org tech esports program here at Texas Tech. And so the question was um, from Phil, our biggest challenge in our collegiate esports program is increasing diversity. Our racial dynamics are very different from your institution, but the gender dynamics are similar. How do you approach gender diversity in your esports program? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, it's something that is is a very pressing question. And let me try to answer it in a couple different ways. Um, I think it's been a little bit of a blind spot for the org, to be totally honest. Um, and I think it, it probably operates on two levels. And there has been kind of a little bit of progress in one way that I'll mention in a bit. Um, one, I think the club is very protective in a way of it of who what it is kind of also more so like less about the kind of definitions i was getting at earlier but just that it's a club that exists and they feel kind of like um they're always kind of fighting for their legitimacy as well and i think something i've talked about with them and, and mentioned is okay how do we make sure that that doesn't 
results in this very insular thing that it's just, you know, five people in a room and no, there's no, you know, openness to outsiders, right? Uh, and I think that often happens along gender lines for sure. Now, one thing I will say that has been kind of promising um, and encouraging is the idea of like free play um, and kind of those open bi-weekly um, just free play sessions has been somewhat successful in getting more um, gender diversity and, and even sort of people who are kind of open to playing the game, but not quite. And um, folks who are just a, a little bit different than our core sort of demographic. Um, and I think that says something about maybe the culture that exists at more competitive spaces um, that can be somewhat off-putting to outsiders. And um, I think it's something that maybe I'd like to explore. And, and I really thank you for the comments because it's, it's something we're thinking of uh, or should think of more. And the other thing though, you know, along the lines of, of the follow-up comment about how this might be problematic when it's integrated into dis institutional discourses about growing enrollment and retention, um, you know, that's, I think, uh, something that I personally, uh, I'm kind of conflicted about too, because sometimes I catch myself in this mindset of, okay, we need to keep growing the club. It needs to constantly be growing, right? There, we need to become a team at some point. We need to bring in, we need to have this money allocated towards us. Um, but then I think like, does it need to be that, you know? Um, does it need to have this kind of like growth at all costs discourse? And, and is that problematic also? Um, and once it gets tied into kind of institutional, um, you know, uh, retention strategies and, and politics and stuff like that, does it lose that, that, that kind of free play fun that um, I think is characterized it so far? So I don't have a perfect answer. I'd love to hear, you know, potentially some other folks' experiences. I know there were some people commenting about kind of the lines that they and the spaces they operate in with their clubs. A lot of us seem to be esports clubs um, folks. And uh, yeah, I think... Uh, Okay, I see that Phil left some comments. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's my answer <laughs> as best as I can offer one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I mean, some of it, uh, I was thinking about during your presentation, just the branding of calling something esports as opposed mm -hmm. to like a gaming club or like a social gaming group or whatever mm -hmm. is, you know, already kind of then bringing in some of the expectations around like, mm -hmm. who is this for? And so like, how do you fight that without also, as you were saying, kind of losing the identity of like, but what is the mission of this club? Is it for intercollegiate competitive? Is it for so yeah. like, yeah, it, that's really tough. So thank you. I really, I, yeah. I was very much appreciating and feeling seen by your, your presentation. Yeah. I love that. I love what Phil <laughs> said about newbie nights. Yes. I, I, I'm going to, that's something I, I'll, if I, if you don't willing, I love to, to, if you're willing, I'd love to copy it. <laughs> right. I uh, copied it from UC Irvine, so I've got the right head. Great. <laughs> Google. Uh, one more question from the chat, and then and please keep them coming in the chat, or then after this one, if folks want to to be the the on camera and ask their questions, that's fine too. Um, so this one is for Jalen, and I lost the question asker. Oh no, it was it was Mar Scar 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 Do I hope I pronounced that. All right. Um, so Jalen, this question is for you. From your perspective, can you give us an example of what a more appropriate Afro-Latino context in video games is or could be? Not like a full concept, but examples to illustrate to people uh, to whom this difference of perception of race that isn't US-based US may be too abstract. And I'll, po I'll post that in the chat again, because there's a couple parts to, to that. So maybe you can, uh, you can take it piece by piece. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for this question, Juan. I just want to kind of totally foreground um, in the move of transparency that I, again, a PhD student, first year, I'm just starting and embarking on this um, research. So please, if and anyone has any ideas of other directions that you might go, um, games that you have examples of, I've been reaching out tirelessly to every contact ever um, to just get, you know, a sense of what's going on in Afro-Latin America um, right now. Um, and I think to kind of answer, attempt an answer at your question, um, everyone wants to see something different, right? In video games and the representation and such. Um, so I don't know if I can say there's one appropriate or um, thing like that, because for me, um, I kind of approach it from a more theoretical perspective. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about 
how, for example, Miles Morales um, and even that big recent video game, that was really impactful for a lot of people, no matter how we criticize it um, and such. I mean, you can just Google it, like a lot of perspectives coming out, just saying how moving it was to see themselves or how moving it was to see this representation and such. Um, and it's tough because you want to represent, um, obviously you want to represent life as it is to a degree, but also you want to help deconstruct some of these hegemonic constructs, right? So it's a tough balance that you have to play. Um, and I point, for example, right, thinking about um, this Miles Morales example. Um, if you, so if you haven't seen the recent Spider-Man movie, please go see it. It was amazing. Um, loved everything about it. Um, besides the criticisms, it was amazing. But there's a moment when um, Electro, Jamie Foxx's character, he says, um, maybe somewhere out there, there is a black Spider-Man. Right. So thinking about all of these different universes that Marvel foregrounds, infinite universes, right? Why is it that race has to still be salient? You know, why is it that this hypothetical Spider-Man has to be black or has to be kind of racialized? Right. What would it mean to think about or to imagine something different or some other Spider-Man who isn't, um, you know, so, or who isn't subjected to our current processes of racialization and such. So, right, that's, that's just kind of where I would, you know, take that idea of like what's appropriate is something that ideally um, gives people what they do want, because I do believe that is important, right? But also that works to deconstruct some of these things that we um, tirelessly critique, you know, on and off again. So, yeah, that's kind of my answer. I hope that gets that some sort of answer. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, your example that you gave of civilization got me thinking about like tabletop role-playing games and board games as well. And the sort of, I guess, literal tokenization, like the transformation of people into tokens. Um, and so, you know, you were saying, oh, if anyone has ideas for further directions, um, the journal Analog Game Studies, I think, would love to hear about both digital and analog versions of this idea and how like you can transform some of these, uh, what would you say, like historical relations into mechanics and maybe some of the positive ways of doing that and some of the negative ways of doing that. So, so thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. So was there any folks who had other questions that they wanted to, to ask out loud to the group or that they wanted to type into the chat? Oh, okay. I see a hand from, um, is it Dazia? Yeah, it is Dazia. Great. <laughs> everyone. Um, I'm actually from Mexico um, and I work in a Mexican uh, studio, but I was wondering, um, it has been differing, dif uh, somewhat difficult for us in Mexico to really know studios from other Latin American countries. Uh, but we have been discovering through Women in Games and, and the Women Game Jam uh, communities more about other women, obviously, <laughs> working on, on this industry. But how well are known the studios in the U.S. compared to, to us? Because for us, it's more like, oh, we are somewhat tiny and we're getting to know each other uh, just for the lols, basically, <laughs> and to get to know everyone. But how well is, is in the United States, like, known how that there are a lot of studios in Mexico, in Colombia, Peru, um, and they are doing like awesome games, but they don't know that those are like Latin American made. So I just want to clarify the question. So you're asking like, how, how do US like how does the U.S. even know whether or not? These yeah, the games perception, are basically. Right. So I would definitely venture to say that they don't. <laughs> that uh, most most gamers, and this is anecdotal. I want to be very clear. I always like to say that when I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> is that um, you know, from my experience, having followed game developers on 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 social media, kind of as an anthropologist, is that most people think of like game developers in the U S as like, you work for a triple a game 
company, right? You're working for EA or work, are you working for a subsidiary that got hired, you know, a production house that got hired to develop the game. And, um, and then you have indie game developers, right? Like even <laughs> you look at indie game, the movie, right? If you've ever seen that movie, you know, it's three white guys that like, and they make great games and they have great stories and everything. But where are the story, where is the documentaries that go beyond that and tell all, because to me, in my head as a digital kid, that's now 42 years old, but as a digital kid, it's like, I see game development like this, all this parallel lines of game development taking place geographically. So whether it's in Eastern Europe and in, in Southern Asia and, and Latin America, Canada, the U.S., like the U.S. loves to present itself culturally as like the epicenter of creation of everything, you know, cultural. But the reality, and I think like that's what I was talking about, uh, Phil, your work earlier was that the reality is that there's there's this whole under part of the graph that's not being shown and over part of the graph, meaning better than what the U.S. is making, that is happening in parallel that isn't being told. And so it's like, literally, like you were talking about how you meet up with other women, you know, in these game jams and, 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 and informal meetups, you know, like, oh, well, we're just meeting. I'm like, when you're a part of a marginalized community, like that is formal. That are, those are like the formals, in my opinion, those are the formal spaces. That's where acts of resistance happen, whether it's even in a, in a form of, of creating a, a space for otherness, like just existing is part of it and then the fact that y'all are meeting up right so um in my opinion a lot of uh representation of women in gaming and minorities in gaming as game developers takes place um in these spaces that you have to seek out for equity sake so one of the things when when uh, arthur was talking about trying to develop a, a, a esports team that is equitable you know, because that was a question I was being asked to him. It's like, it's tough because you have all these males that want to be on the team, <laughs> you know? And so you can have a team. And then to create the equity and the inclusion part, at, and that's the emotional labor as a minority, you're already like having to balance this as a woman in Mexico. Uh, we're like, oh, well, it seems like, you know, everybody, why don't you create an organization, run it and do all this? You know, I don't have time. <laughs> like, no, I'm just wondering, like, if there's an organization that I could join that, like, and that's like the part of, of us as minorities, even this conference itself, this is why we're so excited about this conference was that, like, we're going to have fellow Latinos, Lat Latinx, however we see or, you know, identify ourselves coming together. And literally, this is that liminal space. This is that space that we're creating. And hopefully professional and academic work comes out of it. So I'll get off. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I do that, but that, I'm just, that's your, your question hits at my heart in a good way, like in a good way to me. And that, that is the crux. These are the things that like, I would love to be able to say, go here and you can join this org. But I think it's like, we're going to have to all as a group here collectively think about how can we create a network for you to be empowered and for us to help lift each other all up to create that presence and that recognition of the work that's going on. Like that's the power of this, of this conference. I'm appreciative of y'all putting it on. Thank you. No, well, thank you for that. This is it. If I may add um, a little experience, I actually started working at Gameloft here in Mexico and one of the stories that they always told me when I got in was that because game love in Mexico is, is actually like, they hold for like 20 years. So <laughs> it's quite old uh, as a company at all. And even more in Mexico. But at the beginning, they actually started like hiding the idea that some of the games that they were making were being made in Mexico because of a stigma and a lot of things like that. And that happened for years. Um, so it was like the baseline that they had really good developers and really good things being done, but the clients and everyone else outside of GameLove, they had no idea it was being done in Mexico. So yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, and I see uh, Phil has a hand raised as well. Go ahead. Yes, sorry, I <clears throat> don't mean to dominate the discussion. I'm just super fascinated with everyone's work and thank you all so much for these presentations. Jalen, I wanted to ask you a fantastic presentation. I think you can see by everyone's interest in it, like how much this work is needed in our field. Um, I think that, you know, unfortunately, kind of racism and colonialist perspectives in mainstream AAA type games is kind of unsurprising. Um, what I find almost more surprising sometimes are decolonial and anti-racist video games. And I know I've found, you know, examples that I've latched onto in my own sphere, but I wonder if from, you know, research from an Afro-Latinx perspective, if you could point to any examples of anti-racist video games or decolonial video games that you've encountered. Not so many that I've encountered, but more so through the work of other scholars, um, like, for example, woke gaming, um, um, gaming representation, I'll just drop them in the chat, um, and a bunch of other those, you know, if you just type in kind of the buzzwords of like race, video gaming, or even um, queer game studies is another one. Um, so I found a lot of kind of small examples that scholars, even you in cultural code, right, that you found kind of certain um, examples of these decolonial or anti-racist video games. Um, so, but I will say that depending how we define anti-racist, um, I mean, so one, anti-racist video games, if we're thinking about anti-racist and kind of the mainstream construct, um, right, you know, that a lot of people are latching on to, like, um, and I mentioned corporate multiculturalism, right, our universities are latching on to, you know, diversity and inclusion talks and stuff like that, and this rhetoric of anti-racism has become so um, co-opted by, you know, these institutions and such, um, so, I mean, for me, it's like, I cannot see anti-racist video games now um, in that sense, right? That are trying to um, reach that niche market or that are trying to, um, you know, deflect those certain criticisms and such. So I do think there are games that are trying to do it a little better. And there's many of them, depending on where you look, um, but kind of truly, truly decolonial games that really challenge um, these contracts and such, I'm still still doing that research. I'm not, it just takes a lot more to find it. And also that is just hard as ever, as you know, and a lot of you know, to actually develop and, and you know, follow through with in practice. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have too many that I'm thinking about. Some people have dropped some awesome ones in the chat, um, but yeah, so that's kind of my, Quasi answer. Hope that helps. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight. Uh, something in the chat. So uh, is it Regina or Regina um, said, I also think we need to consider how the tools to make games influence our ability to make a decolonial or anti-racist game. And it got me thinking a lot just about like programming languages and like the languages and the accessibility of the, if you're using Unity, if you're using Twine, if you're using Bitsy, like a lot of times, um, you know, some, maybe there's a mod or a translation, but the, you know, they're definitely designed kind of English first. Um, or even, you know, I was reading an article the other day about um, mapping keyboards to be able to type in other uh, types of languages and like, you know, how many keystrokes does it take to type certain letters uh, in, depending on what language that you use? And so, yeah, I just, I saw that in the chat and I really wanted to call that out and highlight that as something that was a really good contribution to the conversation. I do think we have time for one more question. We can sneak it in if, if anyone has one more question for one of the panelists. Or if the panelists are also welcome to ask questions to each other if anyone wanted to do that. Well, I just wanted to say, I, I mean, Arthur and, and Jalen, I really like what you all had to present. And um, Arthur, I, I think uh, uh, your idea of esports 
Uh, and then Regina mentioning all the other esports groups in the chat. I think it, I mean, like to me, I'm always interested in having like meetups. I'm interested in like um, what those meetups would look like uh, through esports, but also like if there are other um, things that could tie into it, like uh, in terms of cultural events or things that that may be interesting in that way. And then Jalen's like, I just uh, um, your your presentation about race in gaming. I think it, it's it's such a tough one. You know, I'm, I'm like a lot more quiet about it because there's so much work. There's just so much work in it, but I, I really like where you're going with it. And I just encourage you to keep going with it. If I could give any feedback to, in relation to that, um, I, I think that, especially for Jalen, I can relate to what you're doing, man. Like I can relate to that being, um, uh, attention here. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, 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 well, this is my fourth year in, yeah. in a PhD program now, but I was in your shoes, man. I was in your shoes and just to, um, you know, oh, and I was starting off doing my work on um, Latinx representation comics. I was like, okay, where do I start? Where do I begin? And so I like the questions you're asking now within the conversation that we're having in, in, in this wonderful discussion is just, um, those are exact type of questions I'm asking and you'll find those answers throughout um your time but um just keep doing it man like we're all encouraging you and we all believe in you and this community is just a beautiful place to be in right now man and um it's it's uh it's just that work the work you're doing is powerful and and don't forget that like i think that's one of the things that we need to keep reiterating to each other that the work we're all doing here is powerful work that needs to continue to be done within you know to showcase and inspire others not just within academic spaces, but outside to our students and to generalize audiences too, who are interested in gaming too, and to the larger community. We're having a conversation about community and gaming. And, you know, we want to inspire people to, to know like, like about this type of work that we're doing because it's powerful, it's great, it's interesting. And it gives people a chance to think about things in a different perspective. Like for me, the book that made an influence on me was Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. And so that one book made me think about comics in a different perspective that I never would have thought about. Like for me, this conference itself and the fact that Joey and I attempted to do a project on gaming communities, that made me think about video games differently than I never had thought about before because I would just play it, you know? But you're doing work that is, is again, needed. We need the representation. We need this type of uh, work we need these type of conversations and the fact that we have a space like this this is powerful so uh, again thank you to the organizers thanks to everyone here and just keep doing what you're doing man. and if i could maybe just piggyback off of that because I, I think that what a great you know wrap up to the panel but even just to add on to that um the range of disciplines that we have to bring to the table to talk about video games is so wild like we have to simultaneously do like this ethnographic work talking about the physical spaces. We have to talk about the, you know, operationalization of how do you depict something in a digital simulation? We have to talk about the, you know, institutional organizations and how do we like write an esports org constitution and how do we organize events? Like I just, that's the cool thing about game studies is you get to hear all these people from all these different disciplines and you know the histories and the media archaeologies and all these wonderful things and you know no one you know method or no one niche is going to be able to give us the full picture and so thank you so much for you know having this amazing panel that had all these different approaches and all these different subject matters but that ended up being you know talking to each other so perfectly and creating this wonderful like conversation I, I really did appreciate that. Uh, so I don't know if I'm supposed to throw it to Kent to say what's next, or if I'm allowed to just tell you what's on the docket. So, uh, at 11, from 1145 to noon, we scheduled a brief break. So you guys can get a drink and stretch and do all those wonderful things. And then starting at noon, we have Ana Huerta, who's going to be giving, uh, one of our keynotes. She is from EA and she's going to be talking about, um, overcoming personal struggles and becoming a leader. And if you are physically present here in Lubbock, you are welcome to join us in person 
in the media and communication building room 154 to have some lunch and to listen to her speak live, or you're also welcome to join us on Zoom where we're gonna be broadcasting her talk live. Um, Dr. Bowman, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that or Dr. Wilkinson? I think they I think they actually went to go prep the room physically. So um, I guess I will empower myself to say, go ahead and take your break. And I hope to see you guys either physically or virtually for the next keynote at noon. Thank you so much, panelists. Really phenomenal work. Thank you so much. Hey, folks, just a really quick audio check just to make sure you can hear me okay at home. Yep, we can hear you.
Okay, excellent. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Uh, what we're going to do, and, and folks online, feel free to keep talking to each other. Uh, I've actually thought it was kind of neat that throughout the symposium, we've left the Zoom link up so folks have been able to chat during and in between the panel. So please feel free to keep chatting. What we're going to do on our side right now is uh, we're going to let our in-person guest have a quick lunch around noon. And we'll, we'll start the presentation here somewhere around more like uh, 12, 10 to 12, 15 or so. So we're gonna take a little bit of time to kind of switch the rooms over, keep chatting, and otherwise uh, we'll be in touch and we'll check it periodically, okay? Um, you're probably hearing this from Anna's computer, <laughs> but thank you so much for being with us. That's just how I sound. <laughs> progress. You don't always talk like a, uh, you know, I feel like I missed the opportunity.